Tell me how you met John Cock. I met John Cock when I came to IBM for a job interview in 1965, and after I'd spoken to a few people, they inserted him onto the schedule. And uh, at that time, uh, John was just getting ready to leave to start for California with what was to become the ACS project. And uh, for some reason, he decided that I would be a good person to join that project, but he told me that uh, he wasn't allowed to tell me what the project was about. Or, nor what it would be doing or what my role would be, but he encouraged me to come because he thought I would find it uh, just right. But this seemed a little vague to me, and I guess he could tell that I might not want to move to California based on that on that information. So he um, said, ah, oh, the hell with it. I'll, I'll show you all this stuff, even though I'm not supposed to. And he opened the file cabinet, which turned out to be full of dirty shirts, which he then proceeded to dump out onto the drawer and rummage about for four or five minutes. And uh, then um, said, ah, let's forget about all this and let me have you meet uh, some of the other people in the project. And that was the first time I met Jack Bertram and a few of the other people who later did go out. Well, I decided to join Yorktown, but it wasn't until several years later when John and the others came back that I really got to know, to know John. But I never did quite forget the uh, breaking of the IBM image that I had in my mind up until meeting John. And so you and he worked together on ACS? No, I wasn't uh, with the ACS team. No, I, I stayed at Yorktown, and uh, only when John came back to Yorktown uh, did I really uh, get to know him some. Okay. So how do you characterize him besides the dirty shirts? Well, for me, John Cock is uh, probably um, the most consistently creative person I've ever known. Um, very, very, very insightful in very uh, unconventional ways on an enormous range of topics and uh, able to use conventional tools and unconventional ways to solve problems and sometimes invent new ways of solving problems. So I've known John for a lot of years as a friend and for a while as a colleague and um, He's never ceased to surprise me in either in either category. I can't predict what John will come up with, and uh, it will always be original, and it will often be brilliant. And um, I would say that um, the common view of John, I think, by a lot of people who've worked with him, but who maybe don't know him as well as, as some of us do, is that uh, he's almost a caricature of the brilliant, eccentric scientist. But in fact, uh, John is a great deal more than that because he's, um, I think, a very sensitive friend for many people. And I think one of the reasons why you're probably getting as large a response to such an event as this is that John has been a friend and people know he's a friend uh, to many people. He's also very shrewd uh, in his opinions on business and on uh, life in general, uh, way beyond the uh, normal stereotype of uh, sort of a Casey, Ten Casey Stengel type uh, philosopher. Um, John, I think, has very uh, profound insights that on a great many topics um, well outside science. Can you elaborate on that? The, the things I'm interested in are things like uh, your characterization of him as a good friend. Do you have an incident that might illustrate that? Oh, John's been a good friend to me in dozens of ways. Um, he uh, always had the uh, facility to take my mind off problems when I had them and to uh, try to help with solutions. In his uh, own way, he always followed up on things that he knew needed attention, usually providing uh, a version of a solution to it. Um, probably the best drinking buddy you could, uh, could ever find, although you'd have to put up with a lot of napkins filled with equations and um, flowcharts along the way because most of John's um, private life was full of the same strange mixture of humor and business and seriousness as his professional life is. Um, he's just, um, I can't think of any particular incident, but um, I think in, in many ways John was a giver of, of good, non-political uh, advice and uh, counselor, helper. Someone always willing to pitch in and uh, do some work, if, if, usually without having to ask him to do it. So. 
And, uh, you, you also helped me choose my, uh, my current wife, and uh, you had very good taste. You want to try that one again? <laughs> 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 That's fun. No, I, John and John met my uh, my wife um, when we took a trip together to the south of France. Uh, I guess it was in about 1971. And uh, after dinner, he said, uh, "I hope you're not going to be your usual stupid self and let that one get away." And I said, "Oh, you really think so?" And he said, "Yeah, you better marry that one." And uh, well, I listened to him. And, turned out to be very good advice. So, you know. Now, you say that he's got, uh, he's shrewd in his opinions on business as well. Yeah, I think uh, John um, has had the ability to um, be very accurate in his predictions about technology. And I think a lot of people know that. And he's been very um, effective in not only the fields for which he is famous, but in picking the winners in other fields. For example, I remember in the very earliest days of the controversy, John stating after a lot of thinking about the problem that uh, CMOS technology was going to emerge victorious in a wide range of applications, which it has done, and that combinations of bipolar and CMOS would one day be uh, very important. And this, this was a, a controversial and very visionary statement. I, I think a lot of people have had that kind of experience with John. But I think John has also, um, in my opinion, um, been very effective, although he hasn't always been listened to, in um, trying to uh, evolve strategies for how we might be successful in entering new businesses or uh, choosing uh, various paths and businesses we were in. And uh, my particular experience along that line with him had to do with uh, IBM's uh, interest in the early and mid-70s in the telephone business, something that was new for John, but which I thought he displayed uh, tremendous insight and creativity uh, in the business aspects, as well as in the uh, technology, which eventually led to the RISC technology, 801 computer. Now, were you involved in 801 directly or not? Did you already I, I was the manager of the 801. You were, at, yes. you were the manager um, of the 801, so that meant you were managing it, him? Yeah, I was just... Well, um, yeah, I was John Cox's manager insofar as anybody could be John Cox's manager. John is a citizen of the world and ambassador without portfolio, not only in IBM, but uh, in a lot of the universities and research centers of the world. And one of John's great charms, I think, is that he's able to exist in so many um, different environments and be effective in them. But um, John and I became professionally associated uh, during a series of task forces and projects that were um, quite uh, secret at the time that I was responsible for the management of uh, that, ha that had to do with some investigations of IBM potentially getting into the um, telephone business, the telephone switching business specifically. And um, at the conclusion of, the, of that work, um, we decided to make projects out of some of the things which had emerged. And one of those was the uh, computer which John had designed to be the scalable family of controllers for the telephone switches. And uh, that uh, was what subsequently got to be called the 801 computer. Uh, and I was its early manager, but then I got promoted to run the computer science department, and George Radin came in. and. George and John and all the other people, of course, did uh, the work, which is now so uh, justifiably famous. But I think John was really uh, the driving force behind it. a great deal of that, and I think he's been universally recognized uh, for that. Uh, let me ask, the, um, when did you stop beating your wife kind of question, uh, how early in your acquaintance did he start calling you late at night? Oh, I think uh, John and I were both late night people, so I probably called him late at night, maybe almost as often as he called me, but um, John didn't seem to be conscious of day and night. We spent many, many long nights together, either working or socializing or having dinner or being in a bar, and conversations would range from um, things we were both interested in that had nothing to do with computers, um, such as tennis or sports, and uh, all the way through um, John's latest idea, 
for one sort or another, which I was often a, a guinea pig for. Um, usually, be, especially in the later years of our friendship, because uh, I represented the key to unlock some of the resources to get some of the people to work on it. But I didn't mind that, and uh, you never could uh, dismiss any of John's ideas lightly. They always, uh, before he would present them, would represent a great deal of thought, and it would take a lot of smart people sorting through them to determine whether or not they were worth doing. But uh, in my experience, mo most of them were, and a lot of the things that I feel the best about that I've been associated with are really uh, either had their start or received an important contribution from John, including a great many that he never really took official uh, credit for or ever published himself, but gave freely of his ideas and his advice to the people in the projects. Would you say he influenced you? Oh, sure. John has uh, been one of the major influences on the way I think about computers and to some greater extent the way I think about lots of things. He's uh, been, uh, I think, a uh, very good example uh, to me of a uh, way to um, consider a lot of things uh, in terms of their merits and not in terms of uh, emotion or politics. And I think John, uh, more than anyone I've known, has always been able to separate those things, not ignore them, just separate them. And um, I, I think John's had an enormous influence on me, as I think he's probably had on an enormous number of other people. Yeah. How would you um, how would you characterize his lasting impact on either IBM or computer technology or you know up the the field? Well, um, I think John's impact on the field of computing is seminal, pervasive, profound, uh, will be enduring. Um, and I think it's wonderful that the RISC technology has gotten the somewhat unfortunate name of RISC, uh, which is certainly not what I think John intended when he um, produced the original ideas. He was interested in reducing complexity, I think, not instruction sets. But uh, it has caught on and uh, is an important factor. It looks like it'll be an important economic factor. And in fact, a lot of people think that the risk building blocks uh, in various concurrent combinations will be the way many of the uh, workstations and servers of the future uh, will be built. So I think that uh, will by itself stand as a tremendous uh, achievement. It is, of course, made possible by a lot of John's pioneering work in the optimizing compiler field, which I think is uh, equally important. Um, from what I understand, a lot of John's contributions in circuit simulation and parallel machines are having a great impact in IBM and, I guess, indirectly in, in many other places. And um, I think there is hardly anything that I know of in the whole computing uh, spectrum at Yorktown, at least as it was until 1980 when I left, that um, John didn't influence in a positive way, whether it was a project in signature verification or speech recognition or signal processing architectures or um, any of the other activities that related to either system architecture, um, machine design, or uh, software systems. So John's influence in IBM is, uh, I, I find it hard to believe that there's ever been a person in the company that influenced so many people and so many different areas. Uh, so I, I would um, hope that um, IBM will build a big statue to John someday because I think he's been one of the most important people certainly in the last 25 years uh, in the company. Uh, maybe you've already talked about this but you could say it again in another way. How, what do you think is his greatest strength? Um, I think John's greatest strength is the ability to synthesize information from many different fields and bring them to bear in unusual combinations on a particular problem. He has a very, very uh, strong mathematical background, coupled with uh, an intuitive feeling for most forms of engineering and physics, and was able to uh, think about almost any problem in a a way which would bring all these tools to bear, often in very surprising ways. And uh, over the years, I, I sat in rooms and at cafeteria tables and 
heard John uh, surprise uh, mathematicians, physicists, technologists, computer programmers, uh, machine architects by um, taking a, an attack on a problem that wouldn't normally have occurred to somebody who was uh, very deep and, and talented in just one of those fields. So I think John brought this um, ability to uh, somehow think of things in first principles and then to apply a tremendous uh, arsenal of weapons, mathematical and instinctive, to the solution of these problems. Okay. Yeah, well, I first met John when I applied for a job after finishing graduate school uh, to Yorktown. Uh, John was added after the fact to my itinerary for the day and um, began an impassioned uh, discourse to try to convince me to get to go to California immediately for a project that he said he was not allowed to describe and for tasks that he thought uh, he couldn't tell me about found this a little peculiar, and so he started rummaging around in his drawer to get out some information uh, that would make this clearer for me. And unfortunately, the drawer was completely full of dirty shirts, which apparently John had been using as a hamper for quite some time. And so the interview ended with John kind of smoking three cigarettes and rummaging through a whole collection of dirty shirts trying to find his paper. Finally, at the end, he said, oh, the hell with it. I'm going to take you over to Bertram and let him tell you about it. And, uh, that, that later turned into an offer to join the ACS team, but... Uh, as it happened, I elected to stay in the East and uh, went to work at Yorktown on something else. Well, one area that John and I spent a lot of time talking about uh, was sports. And John is um, both a good athlete himself, uh, even though he played infrequently at uh, tennis and golf. He, I think, uh, used to handle himself very uh, surprisingly well, considering how little he practiced and how little time he spent at it, and uh, he had a very uh, keen interest and a very, I thought, a real appreciation of a wide range of, of other sports, both college and, and professional, and since I was interested in many of those same things, that was uh, something we would uh, spend a lot of time talking about. John also liked to talk about um, inventions that he uh, thought one day would be possible. So uh, two of the ones that I guess I've been hearing on and off about for I don't know, 25 years now, are John's version of what cameras should be like. And I'll tell you that uh, many, many years ago, John talked about things that are not a lot different than the new digital uh, video cameras that are just starting to get to be real. Except John's was more advanced, so it'll take uh, Japan a few more years to catch up with him. And uh, also hi-fi systems. And John was always very interested in the uh, room acoustics and the processing of sound to uh, produce essentially ideal sound digitally, and again, uh, the kinds of boxes that you're able to buy these days that uh, do room transfer functions and so forth are things that uh, John and Al Chang and many of the other people at Yorktown used to talk quite a bit about. And of course, with modern electronics and knowing a lot more about uh, some of the um, factors that are involved in psychoacoustics, a lot of these things are now uh, becoming a commercial reality. How about the skiing? Did you ever get into the skiing before? I'm not a skier, so I certainly heard a lot about skiing, but I never went skiing with John. Uh, I know for many years, perhaps he still has a place in Sugarbush where he used to go. And I remember once at Yorktown, we had a visit from uh, Professor Urshoff, who was a friend of John's and one of the most distinguished of the Russian uh, computer scientists. And uh, it was in a time of uh, considerable tension. And uh, I remember that John and uh, Urshoff took off for John's place in Sugarbush, even though theoretically that was a place that was off limits as a place to visit, which was our way of reciprocating for, our government's way of reciprocating for certain places in Russia that Americans weren't allowed to visit. And one turned out to be Sugarbush, and I guess uh, John and Urshoff decided that was kind of silly and uh, took off for a weekend of skiing. But I've, I've never gone skiing with John, although I know it's been an important part of his, uh, his life. How has he managed to accomplish all these things? I guess John has been so successful um, primarily because he's so smart and so creative. 
But I think that uh, other people still might not have accomplished as much as John, because John was not threatening to people. Uh, they knew that he was interested in solving the problem, not in taking the credit for himself. In fact, most of the time he wouldn't take the credit for himself. Uh, he um, has one of the most um, persistent minds that I've ever run into. He doesn't let go of problems. He keeps many, many things going on at the same time, and he teases at them, and pokes at them over long periods of years and years, so constantly refining them and uh, turning them around. He, he's not ever happy with a complex solution. He seeks to simplify things. And I think uh, because of that, he's uh, more likely than many other smart people to get at the essence of a problem and to be able to make a contribution that will be enduring. And I think a lot of people have admired him for his ability to cut through to the core of a problem, even if he didn't always express it in the most succinct and uh, clear way. But um, I, I would say John's ability to synthesize and um, his ability to involve other people. Uh, John is a, has been, as much as anything else, a catalyst for great work in many fields, uh, for example, in mechanical engineering and the disc business and others. So he played a very important role in a lot of those developments, even though um, perhaps some of the final work and inventions were, weren't his own. Well, he worked with Dave Thompson a great deal and uh, others, and John had, uh, John, John thought about this as elements in a memory hierarchy, and he'd think about the kinds of performance characteristics that he wanted them to have in order for them to um, produce systems which were balanced. And in doing that thinking, I believe that he must have uh, felt it necessary to change some of the mechanical and electromechanical components. And uh, because he's an inventive person and had uh, training in an earlier career in mechanical engineering for a while, he was able to uh, combine the, no the systems knowledge of what it was that this really needed to do and uh, ways of improving the access density as well as the uh, uh, other storage characteristics of the media. And by working with people who are deeply trained experts in that field, I think they were able to make a lot more progress than they probably would have without John acting as a catalyzer of that. But, I wasn't, I wasn't too happy with that sequence right. anyway, so. Okay, well, we can either try it again or skip it. I think you should skip it. Okay. <laughs> Let me ask I think there's a lot of people that know a lot about that, that could okay. really, uh, That's fine. Let me then ask about um, something that you made veiled reference to, and that is his clarity of expression or lack thereof. Can you talk a little about that? Yeah, for, for a long time, I used to think of myself as um, John Cox interpreter. Uh, somehow, maybe because I grew up in New York and uh, got used to listening to Casey Stengel on the TV, I found it very easy to understand John, and it didn't bother me that he sometimes started sentences that wouldn't get finished till a week or so later, which he would pick up in mid-phrase. And um, somehow we were always able to communicate easily, whereas a lot of people felt that uh, John uh, was very difficult to understand, they felt he, he spoke in non sequiturs, but uh, I guess I didn't have that problem too often. And in fact, uh, John and I uh, often had the same uh, quirky sense of humor, uh, particularly in long corporate meetings. And uh, since we had shared jokes uh, very freely over many years, we in many cases knew the same jokes and we would think of them in the same situation at the same time. And it got to where we would both uh, look at each other and uh, John would hold up some number of fingers which would indicate there was joke number three that was relevant to the appropriate uh, situation. So we had a kind of shorthand for communicating and uh, a lot of people that I would meet who would be impressed by John but would tell me that they really couldn't understand what he was saying. But um, certainly he didn't like to give talks very often publicly. And um, he also, uh, at least when I knew him, wasn't uh, a very avid writer. Although when he did write something, it usually was quite quite clear and to the point. Uh, so one of the uh, functions that I learned to perform was to listen carefully to John and then to try to get other people involved and sometimes to act as a little bit of a facilitator 
for uh, testing out some of the uh, ideas that he would have at this tremendous uh, rate. I've been hearing the phenomena about uh, not being able to find him in his office. I don't think John ever had an office. Basically, he had a closet, and um, it had a desk in it, and it just was full of papers and clothes and cigarette butts and whatever else uh, John happened to have with him. Uh, John's office was the halls, and uh, he would just walk around and drop into people's offices. Uh, usually was very welcome, I think. Um, dropped in anyway, whether he was welcome or not. And uh, John was a roving gadfly, uh, keeping track of many, many things. Uh, didn't run on a particular schedule, usually, although uh, in my experience he was extremely uh, conscientious and reliable whenever you did need him to uh, come to a particular event or, or be present. I don't remember him ever disappointing me in that regard. But left to his own devices, John's day would, would be uh, wandering about the halls, talking to people, uh, visiting projects, um, visiting universities. And uh, he was astonishingly successful, I would say, in that mode. Can you tell us joke number three? <laughs> no. <laughs> not, not, about one or two. Not, not suitable. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I understand. Okay. Just curiosity. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, after we've turned the cameras off, maybe you'll think about it. You're not going to get... you tell Spencer? <laughs> yeah. you're, you're not going to get... You're going to meet John, but the rest I'm of I'm going to meet John, but the rest yeah. of you are going to get a chance. Well, you ought to watch the video. He's, um, he's one of a kind. What haven't I asked you that you wanted to tell me about? Um, nothing immediate comes to mind. But, uh, Do you have any um, specific incidents or favorite memories that you haven't gotten to? Well, I guess um, I think of John um, often, and usually he'd be uh, very excited in my memory excited about some idea, and uh, kind of impatient in a nice way with most of the people in his audience who weren't quick enough to understand its implication or to follow his uh, reasoning. And uh, usually in my memory there's uh, several cigarettes lit in the room, each being lit from the other. And, um, John is one of the few people that actually did what you always hear about, which is try to write on a blackboard with the end of a cigarette while he put the chalk in his mouth with his other hand. And um, I think that uh, John um, probably, uh, more than anyone I, I know, was able to engender a, a kind of awe in an awful lot of smart people uh, because of the um, consistent invention that he could bring to almost any, any topic. I mean, I really think that in a different way, he was uh, almost like, like in Edison, in that, uh, except that it wasn't really so much by trial and error as it was by just a really uh, superb analytical uh, effort, logic. Great.